Well, first of all, I just want to say that it is such an honor to be here. Um, this is really an extraordinary space. It's my first time at the uh, Agile uh, conference, and uh, it, and I'm finding it really to be uh, uh, really special. Um, so this uh, this session is called the Agile White House. Uh, how the tech far and the digital services playbook are transforming government. And by way of introduction, uh, my name is Aaron Pava, and I am the co-founder of Civic Actions. Uh, we're a digital agency. We focus on the transformation of government through technology. And our primary focus is building digital platforms for federal agencies using free and open source software and agile practices. So we work with everyone from City of San Francisco, City of LA, all the way up to the largest federal agencies, FCC, the Smithsonian. Um, and today what I want to do is talk about some exciting news in the domain of government transformation, especially as it relates to agile practices. But before I go on, I just want to get a sense of who else is in the room. And so um, if you work in the government um, currently, show of hands. Oh, wow. OK. So it looks like more than half, maybe 3 quarters of the room. And, um, and are people familiar with the tech bar or digital services playbook already? Let's show of hands. OK, quite a few people. Excellent. Um, and then what about um, people that aren't in government but just focus on Agile, your coach, or you work in an Agile practice of some form, some type? OK, great. Excellent. So to start this conversation, I really want to start with this premise, that the status quo is no longer an option. This may yet not be a surprise to you. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, a website called healthcare.gov, which was indicative of this problem. Um, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I want to give some background on the scale and the scope of the problems that currently exist. So it's hard to imagine, but the government currently spends more than $80 billion a year on federal IT. To put that in perspective, the entire music industry is $5 billion a year. So this represents about 2% of the entire uh, $3.9 trillion annual budget to run the government. So one might expect that we would have some of the best digital services in the entire world. <laughs> However, According to a research firm, 94% of large federal IT projects over the last 10 years have been unsuccessful. More than half were delayed or over budget or didn't meet the user's expectations. More than 41% failed completely. And just to paint a picture of what that looks like and the numbers that we're talking about here, the VA had a scheduling replacement uh, project that was terminated after spending $127 million over nine years. Uh, OPM, Office of Personnel Management, uh, had a retirement systems modernization project that was canceled after spending or excuse me, $231 million um, after their third attempt. Uh, the VA, uh, financial and Logistics IT Enterprise Program was terminated after spending more than $609 million. The DOD's combat support system was canceled after more than spending a billion dollars and failing to deploy after five years. Homeland Security had an initiative, the Border Initiative Network. They obligated more than a billion dollars didn't meet cost effectiveness or viability standards, and was canceled. This is the status quo. And even those that don't fail, they're plagued with issues of low quality and cost overruns. 
So um, you may be familiar that for the last 15 years, the DOD and the VA have been working to modernize their electronic health records. Um, a couple years ago, after more than a decade of working on that, they decided to scrap that and instead focus on achieving just interoperability between the two programs. Uh, the uh, United States Citizen and Immigration Services uh, they were working to transform their paper filing system to a consolidated paperless electronic case management system. Uh, still in progress, but I know that it's more than $500 million. Although the USCIS does have some promising news, which I'll share in a bit. Unfortunately, the way that many of these systems are designed just don't take into account the end users. Uh, oftentimes there's no working software until it's way late in the development process. Um, and when they can't really adapt to changes based on user feedback even if it's being done. The use of proprietary software leaves no opportunity or for flexibility or collaboration or reuse. And once an application is in the testing phase, it's really difficult to go back and change something that wasn't really well thought out in the conceptual phase, which could have been many, many years earlier. And much of these issues have to do with outdated procurement process. So unlike the private sector, um, in the government, there's thousands and thousands of pages of government regulations. It's called the, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, otherwise known as the FAR. Um, a lot of these uh, regulations really discourage uh, small businesses to innovate and even attempt to navigate these rules. So the system is antiquated. The system to buy software is really antiquated. Um, and it's really designed for a waterfall process or more designed by bridges and tanks and that type of thing as opposed to modern software development. Um, and you know, it can work if, you know, waterfall works when the requirements are very well known, they're fixed, it's stable. It's not a very good model for complex projects. It's a very poor model when it comes to long and, out, and, long and ongoing projects. And this, by a large account, is how things are done today. So that's the status quo. However, there's good news. There is a sea change that's being driven by a number of factors. Most, notice, most notably, citizens are becoming a lot more savvy, even over the last few years. And you still might be thinking, well, there's a lot of inertia, the old way of doing things. But I want to um, propose some indicators to demonstrate that there actually is some hope. First. The way that we build software, and this is probably not news to the folks in this room, but the way that we build software over the last 10 years has fundamentally changed. Now, I'm a Bay Area native, really entrenched in Silicon Valley and the Silicon Valley culture, and I can tell you firsthand about this revolution. And Silicon Valley is really leapfrogging government IT. But that wasn't always the case. Government used to be decades ahead of consumer technology. And now there's all these advances when it comes to collaborative software development, especially free and open source software development, open data, APIs, the cloud, mobile, DevOps. For example, Amazon now deploys software every, every 11.6 seconds. And of course, one of the biggest advances is in agile software development. Secondly, we're entering what Steve Case um, of AOL uh, calls the third wave of the internet. Has anyone heard of the third wave of the internet? A couple people. So this is a new concept. Um, first wave was really that period from 1985 to about 2000. And that's where we we're building infrastructure and the connections, basically uh, the on-ramps to the information superhighway, if you will. 
Um, and that's what that was like all the companies like Cisco and IBM and Microsoft and Netscape and AOL. I mean, it was getting people online, building that infrastructure. And we're just probably coming to the end of the second wave, which is really building on top of the internet, applications on top of the internet, and connecting people to one another. So, you know, think about Google and Apple and Facebook and Twitter. It's all about seamless integration between hardware and software and services. And then there's the explosion of the smartphone and enabling us to be always connected to the web and unle uh, unleashing the app economy. So the third wave is really what's coming next. And this is the transformation of the economy's largest sectors using digital services. So healthcare, education, energy, financial services, food, government services, education. These third wave sectors, all ripe for disruption, represent more than half of the US economy. Free and open source software is now the de facto standard. And it's not just about software, but it's about the ethos behind the software itself collaboration and forking, sharing, think Android, Drupal, WordPress, GitHub. And all the successful companies in the second wave adopted free and open source software as their path to success. Fourth, there's the rise of the digital services. And thanks to the prevalence of APIs, application programming interfaces, It'll soon be possible to create businesses simply by composing applications together to drive new business processes. So this shift to digital business models is expected to fuel the next phase of growth for a services economy that will create trillions of dollars of economic growth in the years ahead. And finally, and this is what I'm really inspired around, there's a whole new generation of digital natives who are civic-minded idealists. In their worldview, every government service can be reimagined with technology. For example, if you don't like your current Metro app, you can build a better mousetrap with all the open data that's available. Organizations like Code for America are building dozens of applications each year to make cities smarter and more effective. And there's a whole new slew of startups looking to create better social services using mobile and data in the cloud. Which brings us to the huge opportunity ahead. So let me share about a new promised land, a completely transformed government. Let me paint a picture of what's possible on the horizon. Imagine the best and brightest talent in the world solving complex issues. Rather than going to internet startups like Google or Facebook or going to Wall Street, they take on careers of service, working in the public sector. These engineers, creatives, and agile project managers use the latest in thinking, latest thinking in design thinking and human-centered design. They focus on how citizens interact with government service on all levels, from getting to the bus to paying their taxes. And by using flexible, modular, scalable, agile approaches, we could solve these problems faster and get to market quicker. All this means using less resources of that $80 billion a year to develop IT. So it's more money for other services. It's less waste. We're using open data and APIs. We're sharing and repurposing. We're not having to pay for things over and over and over again. We're not wasting money. We're deploying more. We're, using we're deploying more quality software than ever before. And it all begins a virtuous cycle of gov tech and civic tech, of a whole ecosystem where everyone's building better mousetraps. The development becomes exponential. We're enabling an agile economy. Sounds great. Of course, there's some big and nasty obstacles in way of that vision. The US government is a big ship to change direction, and this process can take a lot of time. For one, 
the money and interests have a huge stake in protecting the status quo. There's simply a lot of momentum in the default way of doing things. The federal government has doing it, been doing it backwards for a long time. And when it comes to software development, Waterfall is a lot easier for them to understand and to buy for. Not to mention addressing all the cultural issues that go along with this new mindset. Now some people will argue that government can't be innovative. And there's plenty of evidence to back that up. Or if it can be, there's a culture of fear of being fired, of being sued, of failure, all of that. Security and privacy issues aren't unique to building software for the government, but they do take a more significant role. Some of these concerns means that right now you can't always use a modern technology stack. For example, cloud providers like Amazon's AWS need to be certified. And many software as a service or, or platforms as a service simply can't meet the high bar of security necessary for the federal workplace. Which again means no matter how well intentioned can't be as innovative as they are with the private sector, as they are within the private sector. Of course, there are problems of scale, adoption, and training as well. So Agile just can't be done halfway. This transformation will require a massive culture shift, requiring years of retraining, as well as reimagining government IT. And retooling from, of IT delivery uh, would require some of the biggest software providers in the world to really change their ways. And we're talking about really, really big systems. Booz Allen has more than $3 billion in government IT. <laughs> Hewlett Packard, near, nearly $4 billion. General Dynamics as well, Raytheon almost, and, and Boeing are around $5 billion, Northrop Grumman nearly $7 billion, and Lockheed Martin nearly $11 billion. And probably the largest barrier, which many of the above issues touch upon, is that procurement isn't flexible enough for agile software development. Government procurement rules have really fallen out of step with the pace of technology making it difficult for the government to access the most current and relevant tools available. There's very few new companies entering the market. In fact, out of the top 25 government contractors, uh, all, nearly all of them were founded in the 70s. In one survey, nearly 60% of senior level government IT officials cited that procurement was the significant barrier to innovation. So let's just give up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, let's discuss what's happening and what, we need, and what needs to happen in order to over, overcome these seemingly large obstacles. So when it comes to the moneyed interest, there's a lot at stake. So how can we change the status quo? Well, despite all the bad press, healthcare.gov really did change the conversation. The way government buys and delivers technology was bought, brought into light in a significant way. It was on the front page of the New York Times for weeks, as well as every liberal and conservative uh, news outlet, good and bad. And largely as a result of that, the US Digital Services was born. So this was the Fixer team from Silicon Valley that swooped in to save the day. And once they completed fixing healthcare.gov, uh, many of them stayed and became housed under the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. And this team includes some of the really well-known technologists like Mikey Dickerson and Megan Smith, both from Google, as well as people from Facebook and Twitter, Amazon, and a lot of those companies. Also, as a result of uh, former CTO Todd Park in his Presidential Innovation Fellow, Fellows Program, uh, 18F was born. And 18F is a new office under the GSA, General, Serv General, Services, General Services. The name refers to where its location on 18th and F Streets. And this group makes digital product, 
products for government organizations using lean and agile methodologies, open source code, and contemporary programming languages. But they're an inside government skunk groups, skunk works group. And together, they're beginning to change the rules of the game, which I'm going to share in a bit. And to address one of the other obstacles that government can't be innovative, I want to share a few of the initiatives that are currently happening. So the Presidential Innovations Fellow Program that I spoke about a moment ago, that pairs innovators from the private sector, and these can be people from nonprofits or academia or technology, and it brings them into government to collaborate on solutions to deliver significant results in a period of six months on some of the government's largest challenges. So this was established in August of 2012. And in that first round, there was 18 fellows. And there were 700 applicants. Uh, the second class had 43 fellows and 2,000 applicants. And these are really a lot of the best and brightest. Many of these people, after their tour of duty, stay on and work at 18F agency under GSA or other government agencies. The U.S. Digital Services has also been quickly expanding. So it started off as a, as a I believe, a dozen or so people um, focused on health care. And then it's currently 50 or 60 people and only budgeted at about $20 million for this year. However, next year in the president's budget, uh, they're planning to expand $120 million and work on 60 to 80 projects within the government. And these are like really meaty projects. Um, there's thousands of applications coming in for people that want to support these. And these are really, you know, top tier technologists that normally would be going to technology companies in the Bay Area. So, one of the successes, and I like sharing about this one, is that the, the, um, there was a project, I believe it was, it was at the VA, and it was a project that was estimated to take five or seven years, it was seven years, it was going to cost $1.2 billion, it was a modernization effort. The U.S. Digital Services put five people on this project and have delivered the result that was expected of the initial contract. So that's what's possible. So in order to bolster an agile trained workforce, the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of Federal Procurement Policy recently offered a prize, they're doing the prizes, um, for anyone that could develop a training program focused on training contracting officers on agile practices. And the goal of this prize competition is to develop a digital services contracting professionals training and development program for federal government, which would be used to add digital services core plus specialization for contracting, for contracting professionals. That's a lot of buzzwords, I know, but let me break it down what I think it means. They understand that, that procurement officers are a big barrier to Agile being adopted within federal government. And in order to make this shift, we need to train the procurement officers, the actual buyers within government, to understand these tools. And so OPM is investing in pilot programs in order to train procurement officers specifically on what they need to do and how to formulate government contracts to work with Agile practices. I think this is really, really big. And this is also huge. The government's moving to GitHub. And so for those that aren't familiar with it, GitHub is a user-friendly website that helps people and organizations share code and collaborate on projects. It's kind of like a social network around code. So organizations on GitHub, GitHub can make their projects private or public. Uh, generally they're public 
and the repository needs to be public for others to view, to download, to copy, to comment on, to make changes. And there's already over 500 agencies across the world, the national, state, and local level, that are making use of GitHub's tools. This is really great. So if one agency starts developing on GitHub, some tool that's specific to their use, but another agency has an analogous use, they could use that code and adapt it, fork it, and reuse it, or contribute to the original source code. And then this is another uh, innovative uh, or innovation that's happening, which is that there's a, there's a trial project called GovConnect, also under the OPM, that uh, allows federal employees to share knowledge and collaborate and apply their skills to address the challenges beyond their traditional job classifications or organizational geographic location. So think about, this is kind of like a task rabbit for government agencies. Um, so this is currently being piloted with several agencies and poised to spread across the government really soon. Of course, one of the bigger obstacles facing the transformation of government IT are the issues of security and privacy. And there's a lot of momentum here as well. By using the Agile and Flexible Framework, um, FedRAMP is enabling the federal government to accelerate the adoption of cloud computing by creating transparent standards and processes for security authorizations and allowing agencies to leverage security authorizations on a government-wide scale. So this program is designed to comply with the FISMA Act of 2012, and now it's much, much easier to stand up uh, a cloud system within the government. This was not even possible a year ago. Well, maybe, I don't know if it was possible a year ago. It's much, much easier now. And in just the last few months, a number of companies have met the stringent agency FedRAMP requirements. So uh, uh, there's a bunch, uh, the Amazon AWS Public Cloud, there's the AWS Government Community Cloud, there's Black Mesh. So there's a number of these that are being stand up. This is really good news, for good news for developers because this is really how software is developed now. And so this removes a huge barrier that was in the way. So innovations in cloud computing, big data, and uh, cyber physical systems are bringing dramatic changes to how we use information technology. And NIST, the National Institution of Standards and of Technology, um, has drafted a new privacy risk management for federal information systems. And basically what this document is, it's a framework for privacy risk management. And it provides a common vocabulary. And it outlines uh, uh, objectives to facilitate the privacy engineering and risk model for assessing privacy risk in these IT systems. And last, there's the, um, a lot of tools that are used with innovative companies have terms of service that are not compatible with, uh, with the federal government. And so there's a new uh, federal compatible terms of service agreements that are being negotiated with a lot of these uh, social media, mobile, and um, digital services tools. And this is an impor important first step. So help the federal agencies better engage with the citizens and use the modern tools. And it'll remove a lot of the problematic clauses that prevent the federal employees from legally being able to use these tools. Um, one of the tools that we use called Slack, which has been completely transform transformative of our organization's culture. Um, up until recently, well, Slack's a pretty new tool. It's only been around for about a year and a half or so. But, the, but uh, it was only a month or two ago that this new terms of service was made available so that um, feds can use Slack. And of course, there's always going to be problems of scale and adoption and training. So shifting an organization like Google to Agile is one thing. There are 60,000 people. But what about when you have an organization that's 3 million people, like the federal government? 
So as I mentioned before, the Office of Management and Budget offer, you know, offered a challenge to scale um, Agile training. The GSA and 18F are working to create a federal marketplace of Agile vendors. And the Digital Services Playbook and the Tech Bar are approaches to bringing Agile at scale. These documents are intended to give a very clear guidelines to federal vendors like ourselves on practices and while at the same time, how to use the federal acquisition regulations. So I'm going to go in much greater detail about these in a few minutes. And the last argument is probably the medias, that procurement just isn't flexible. Yet there's a lot of movement here as well. For example, the U.S. citizen in immigration, I mentioned them earlier, they have fully adopted Agile as their development model. So they went from issuing new capabilities every couple of years to every quarter, and they have a new flexible Agile development services contract, which is kicked into high gear. And now they're able to do releases every quarter. Soon they're going to be able to do releases every month. Um, in the near future, uh, Mark Schwartz, their CIO, uh, who I believe is here, um, said he hopes to be releasing new apps and software every day. This is great news. And they've been able to do all this while still, without making any changes to the FAR. So this is all within the current regu regulatory system. So software acquisitions really need to move at the speed of agile development cycles. And ideally this means moving from four weeks from solicitation of a contract to the kickoff. And from there, no more than three months to when you develop uh, an MVP, a minimal viable product. The shift uh, to software, the software procurement paradigm, uh, there's been a new uh, GSA has issued this new government-wide uh, BPA, Blanket Purchase Agreement, to gather a group of vendors, probably 20 or so to start, to be able to deliver agile delivery services using user-centered design and agile software and DevOps, and be able to place these agile vendors inside agencies. And this is one of the big ideas um, of how GSA sees how agile will scale with inside the federal government. So there's also a rapid technology prototyping contracts. These are innovative contracting models that, um, that give a chance to try out innovative technologies. The way it works is that you have um, uh, you could develop prototypes by de applying the new technology that's relevant to demonstration to demonstrate scenarios within a demonstrated framework. Um, so these can be used by government for rapid and inexpensive assessment of cutting edge or unproven but potentially transformational technologies. So another very cool potential contract vehicle. And then, of course, there's the digital service playbook and tech bar. So now I really want to shift the conversation. That's a lot of background, I know. But that kind of sets the stage to what digital services playbook and the tech bar are. So almost a year ago to the day, the US digital services was announced. And during their announcement, they released these two documents. Um, so the U.S. Digital, uh, the, and it's all about best practices for delivering government IT. So the Digital Services Playbook, which is posted on GitHub, and it's a collaborative document, consists of 13 plays, as you would call them, drawn from successful practices from the private sector and the government, if followed together, will help the government build effective digital services. And this document includes some of the best practices, checklists, and a set of questions to guide IT acquisitions aimed both at vendors and procurement officers within the government. So critically, and most relevant to this conversation, the playbook focuses on agile technologies. 
and how to deliver iterations early with multiple testing periods and frequent revisions. So I'm going to go over briefly the 13 plays, but I want to call out three plays in particular. And so I'll pause on those ones and kind of do a deeper dive that are most relevant to the Agile community. So the first play is understanding what people need. You must begin digital projects by exploring and pinpointing the need for the people who will use the service and the ways that it will fit into their lives. We need to understand the different ways that people will interact with our services, including the actions they will take online through a mobile application, on a phone or in person. Every encounter, whether it's offline or online, should move the user closer to this goal. Make it simple and intuitive. Using government services shouldn't be stressful, confusing, or daunting. It's our job to build services that are simple and intuitive enough that users succeed the first time unaided. And here's the first one I'm going to go a little bit deeper on. Build the services using agile and iterative practices. Now, let me just step back the 30,000 foot view here. This is the this is the White House initiatives saying <laughs> build the services using agile and iterative practices. So we want to use incremental and fast style of software development to reduce the risk of failure. We want to get working software into the user's hands as early as possible to give the design and development team opportunities based to adjust based on the user feedback about the service. We want a critical capability or a critical capability is being able to automate test and deploy the service so that new features can be added often and put into production early. Good stuff. So here's some of the checklists is what do they mean? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what what it'll have is uh, it has the play itself, and then it'll have a checklist like this, and then it'll have more explanatory tests and like questions you could ask yourself or ask your team if, if you're applying. So it really is meant to like support you if you don't know like how to do this. Um, as an aside to that point, when 18F um, released that blanket purchase agreement uh, contract, um, or uh, I guess it was it was under the GSA 70 schedule, so it was that contract vehicle. But they're trying to build a, a list of agile development vendors. Um, they specifically called out the, the, the DSP and as part of the evaluation criteria, we believe, it wasn't explicit, but you know you could kind of read between the lines, that you're going to have to use the digital services playbook as basically that, instead of like do you have, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, past quals, you know, it's more like are you checking off all the boxes of the DSP? So this is really important stuff, and it seems to be the direction that the government's moving forward. And so this is this is pretty awesome, and I think really aligns with where you know what we're, where we are in this conversation. So, you know, we want to ship a functional uh, MVP that solves core users' needs by addressing the services as soon as possible. Ideally, no more than three months that you get something to the users. You want to run usability tests frequently and see how. The service works for the users and identify improvements that should be made. We want to ensure that individuals building the services are in close communication using tools such as daily stand-ups and team chat tools. We want to keep delivery teams small and focused, limit organizational layers that separate these teams from business owners. Release features and improvements multiple times a month, create a prior to Prioritize backlog of features and bugs, known as the feature backlog and bug backlog. Use an issue tracker to catalog features and bugs. Use source code versioning control. Ensure the entire team has access to the issue tracker and version control system. And use code reviews to ensure quality. So this is really a lot of best practices. Yes.
Yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I mean, I think that, I mean, this is, this is really sticky. I mean, the, the thing is, you know, as we've already discussed, like, the status quo is really broken. The current, the, the current system of, of procurement and the amount of time that it takes in those contract vehicles and, like, and, and getting approvals like that's not going to work inside this. We actually really have to come up with new contract vehicles, or or new ways of procuring software and much shorter iterations. So I think that the idea, and I don't know, and, and unfortunately I was going to have a co-presenter here, uh, Tracy Walker from the U.S. Digital Services, so I was going to hope to be able to address some of these more specific uh, needs, and she wasn't able to make it, but but um, she's working feverishly on this problem specifically, working on how do we make it so that we can have much shorter uh, procurement cycles and then that we could, it, so you don't have that six months from, you know, to award. You know, you ideally you want to have it less than four weeks and you want to have be delivering code within three. Yes, this is the lead procurement officer of the U.S. White, uh, the lead procurement officer at the White House. Yes. Um, well, it depends. So you want to be able to deliver to users, not necessarily all users. Um, and with a system like as complicated as that, you, you break it down into component parts. So I mean, that had dozens of, of agencies working on that. And they're all working on different parts of it, right? And a lot of those components were actually delivered within a short time period. They just weren't collaborating with each other. Mm -hmm. But for example, one of the big mm -hmm. issues with um, with the initial rollout of healthcare.gov was that it just couldn't deal with the load balancing of all these users creating accounts. That is one of the priority needs of a system. How do you build a system that you could actually have a million people hit the system without it creating a denial of service attack? And be able to register new accounts. Now, um, now the solution uh, that they came up with, and this is a bit of an aside, but like the solution they came up with was that all the people that were accessing the health exchange um, weren't actually needing to create an account right away. That there was really there was a whole bunch of people that needed to view information on the web, people that were going to start evaluating healthcare options and creating accounts. So one of the things, so when you would build a, an MVP in this kind of process, what you would look at is what are the what are the main barriers? What's like the most critical functionality that needs to happen no matter what? Like I would say that was probably one of the most critical things. How do you design a system that could scale nearly infinitely, be able to bifurcate users, and then for people that register system, register accounts, that they can, um, that they could at least create an account. I mean, the big, the big problem, at least as I understand it, was in creating accounts, right? Like it just couldn't generate. Now Google knows how to do that. They know how to like release a service and and, and scale quickly. Um, so so what you would do is you would build like that would be an MVP, and so you would build just something to test that. And then, um, and then basically do like load balancing tests and be able to like, you know, have robots basically pound it as much as you can. You could buy services that replicate 
that kind of behavior. So you could demonstrate, yes, we know that 100,000 people could concurrently create accounts you know, per second or minute or hour or whatever it is, and that we trust the system's gonna work. And then once you've rolled that out, then you build the next level of functionality. So it's not mean, it doesn't mean like we're gonna build healthcare.gov in three months, but it's like, how could you get software tested in incremental stages? Yeah. So shipping doesn't mean shipping. It doesn't necessarily mean shipping to the customer, but it means, but you do want to get software in front of users as fast as possible. I mean, agile software development, you know, it's like that whole, I mean, I guess it's more like lean, but it's like you, like the, how do you, how do you, um, you know, it doesn't matter how efficiently you build software if you're building the wrong thing, right? Like, if you're going down the path, that's all wasted cycles. So the, the idea is like, how do you build just enough software to test the hypothesis, get real users interacting with that software, understanding that that's a real problem, that people want to use this, and then you build the next level. So you're only building what's, what you trust that users are gonna want, what they're gonna use, and you're not wasting all these other cycles. And that's the idea of getting users in the cycle. When you work on, I mean, some of these pro programs are like 10 years, which is crazy because, you know, requirements, that means like you're developing fixed requirements that probably took two years in committee, a stack of documents this big. We work on projects like that, not many, but we have one project that started that way. And it's, and it doesn't account for like a whole change that, that the world changes. You know, that like technology changes, that there's better ways of doing things and that um, and user behavior is going to change. And so it, it, this is just a way to try to, you know, reel that in and get real users using it as fast as possible. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that, that is the issue. I mean, and this is why we need to reimagine what, how we, how we do this procurement. I mean, I, I can't answer, because I'm not inside government, so I, and I'm not a procurement specialist, so I don't, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer all those questions. But what I can say is I know the intentions of what they're trying to do. And the intention is, how do we create these, this BPA bring in companies that are certified in agile practices and and then and then have those companies begin to collaborate and work within each other. So is Mark Schwartz in the room? I don't know. He's not, no, okay. So Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.
I've seen the same thing. Now, it's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, that doesn't work. And I, you know, I think I mean innovation's good and experiments are good, but a lot of them, you know, don't I mean we have a project like that that is similar where it's you know, it's function points. It's an agile based project, but it's using function points to try to like to to solve that problem and it you know it's it's not a one to one map. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Yes. Right. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this goes to the point that this one was, uh, one was making, which is that, um, you know, I mean, the definition of, of uh, full product or, you know, production versus shipped code in front of users. And this is the work that OMB needs to do and GSA needs to do, which is help define these terms and do the training with procurement officers. And because I don't know necessarily the procurement officers can define that and the procurement officers are often divorced from you know the the users that are going to use the system and so uh, yeah I mean there's a these are the barriers I mean no doubt procurement is the number one barrier here and this is what's being addressed I mean, but a lot but this is what it's trying to address um, but I think your question is, or your comment is completely valid which is um, you know the, 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 the distinction between you know, full production versus shipping shippable code in three months. Yes. That's great. That's great. Okay, I'm getting a, a, a time warning. We have about um, 15 minutes. I do want to leave a little bit of time at the end. This has actually been really great. To, I, I love the interaction and I hope to do a little bit more. So let me kind of cruise through the rest of this um, and then we could open it up again. Uh, but if you do have a question, feel free to you know, interrupt. I don't, I don't want to do this at the sake of your questions. Um, uh, where were we? So we we're talking about the 13 plays, and I was calling out three specific plays. One of those we just talked about using Agile and iterative ser services. This is the second one, which is um, structural budgets and contracts to support delivery. So again, more Agile uh, recommendations or, uh, or plays. And this is really to improve the chances of success when contracting out our development work. We need to work with experiencing, experienced budgeting and contract officers. So I think that's, that's a key, you know, people that actually understand these terms and, and, and have the background here. So a well-defined contract can facilitate good development practices like conducting research and prototyping phase, refining product requirements as a service is built, evaluating open source alternatives, ensuring frequent delivery milestones, and allowing the flexibility to purchase cloud computing resources. And then here are some of the checklists, kind of a deeper dive on, on, on um, play five. You want to have the budget include 
research, discovery, and prototyping activities. Um, and again, I think this kind of points to what we're discussing here, which is like, how do you make something shippable? And it's like, well, we can build prototypes, and we can get into a small set of users, or we can do some research in, in, or build in stages. Um, have the contract structured to request frequent deliverables, not monthly multi-month milestones. Um, the contract that gives government delivery team enough flexibility to address feature prioritization in delivery schedule as the project evolves. And the contract ensures open source solutions are evaluated when technology choices are made. Yes. With what? Yeah. Which is all now in the Uh-huh. Right, so, so the tech bar is basically saying if it has earned value management as a requirement, you can't do, you can't implement some of the tech bar solutions because it's at odds with this. Okay. So is that, is this contradiction with the zone? Because there's this, I don't, I don't. Um, I, but if someone does, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, there are Right. So uh, moving on to the rest of the plays, and I'll kind of rip through these. Um, assign one leader that holds the person accountable. So this is the, there must be a single product owner who's the authority and responsibility to assign tasks and work elements, make business product and technical decisions, and be accountable for the failure or success of the overall product. I want to bring in experienced teams. We need talented people in government who have experience working in modern digital services, um, including seasoned project managers, engineers, and designers. We want to choose a modern technology stack, deploy in a flexible hosting environment, automate testing, and this is another one I'm going to call out. Um, so today, developers write automated scripts that could verify thousands of scenarios in minutes and deploy updated code in production environments multiple times a day. And so we use these uh, updated or automated performance tests to simulate surges in traffic and identify performance bottlenecks. And so while manual tests are still and quality assurance is still necessary, you want automated tests to provide the constant reliable protection against the unreliable regressions and make it possible for developers to confidently release frequent updates to the service. So here's the checklist um, regarding uh, that. And you know, so it's you want to have created automated tests that verify all user-facing functionality, create unit and integration tests to verify modules and components, 
run the tests automatically as part of the build process. So as you're committing code, then the test runs and can produce the results. So you could roll back if you need to. Perform those deployments automatically with deployment scripts, continuous delivery services, and similar techniques. And connect load and performance load tests, excuse me, load and performance tests at regular intervals, um, including before the public launch. And then the last uh, three, manage security and privacy through reusable processes, use data to drive decisions. So at every stage of a product project, you really want to measure how well the service is working for users. And that includes measuring how well the system performs and how people are interacting with it in real time. So and teams and agencies should really carefully watch these metrics. You want to find the issues and identify bug fixes and improvements that need to be prioritized. That's along with monitoring tools. And then this is probably one of my favorites, which is the default to open. So when we collaborate in, open and, and in the open and we publish our data publicly, we could improve government altogether. And th this quote, I think, kind of really summarizes the, uh, the spirit of this. Too often, the lack of guidance encouraging agency use of innovative contracting practices results in narrow and overly rigid interpretations of the federal acquisition rules that complicate the government's ability to adapt smarter ways of acquiring high quality digital services. Um, that's just not a quote from anyone. That's a quote that was attributed to a, a document that was signed by Todd Park, at the time the CTO, uh, Steve Van uh, Rokul, who is the CIO, and then Beth Colbert from OMB, Director of Management. So, oops, TechFAR. Um, and we've already kind of jumped into this a bit because the digital service playbook is kind of like the rules. Here's the plays. Here's how you can do it. Here's the questions to ask. Here's the checklist. This is the, this is the guide. And then the tech FAR is here's how you could use the FAR. It's kind of like the cheat sheet for the FAR to justify how to apply the digital services playbook, um, the rule book, if you will. And so it really highlights the flexibilities within the FAR that could help agencies implement the plays um, and, uh, and have that acquisition support. And in a, it has a particular focus on how contractors could support iterative customer-driven software development process as it's done in the private sector. Um, so the, the first part about the tech FAR really just answers a lot of general questions about Agile and how it applies to federal IT. Um, how you can use Agile in your technology procurement cycle. It's really the Q&A part. Second part is really about, uh, and this is actually really key. I, I guess I want to pause here and call this out a bit. Um, one of the, the challenges that, that um, folks often find is like, well, how can, I, how can I get this? If I don't have fixed requirements, how am I going to get this? You know, doesn't the FAR 15.203 say that we have to have, um, you know, requirements. Um, and uh, the tech FAR says that, well, you could actually have a product vision and that will meet the requirements, uh, 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 you know, regulation. So it goes on to, like, what a product vision incorpor incorporates. So it says, like, you know, who it's for, who's the target customer, um, the statement or the who, the statement or need of opportunity, the product name, the product category, the key benefits, the compelling reason why you need to buy it, it's unlike anything, the primary differentiation. And so it, it defines like this is how a product vision is defined and then examples of product visions as well. So, and how you meet that requirement. That's a stumbling block for a lot of people. So, um, third, it answers a lot of the questions regarding contract vehicles like is IDIQ the only way that we could do this? The answer is no. You could actually use a lot of contract vehicles to do this. Um, and, it, and it suggests some other ways, uh, but uh, I don't need to go into detail on that. Uh, fourth, it goes into some Q&A about pricing considerations, like um, can we only use fixed price contracts to get the desired results? Um, 
And the answer is no, it's not different than any other type of contract. Um, uh, fifth, it goes into the use of competition and how do you ensure effective use of competition. And uh, the answer to that really is by applying similar processes used for performance-based contracting and identifying the desired outcomes rather than the details of the design on how to perform the work. And last, it goes into the contract administration, um, the challenges and committing staff and this is, a, this is a big thing. It's like, well, people say, well, Agile requires that we need to commit more staff because we need to have people involved within this, in the process. And, you know, what if we, our agency has limited resources and we can't commit the staff, which is a real concern. And, and that should be a real concern. And um, it basically addresses that saying, like, well, you need to have <laughs> the staff. I mean, you need to ensure that adequate resources are applied to managing the contracts irrespective of the strategy used. So if you're using Agile software, that's no exception. And while the process is really highly interactive, the overall, overall amount of work that's required is not greater. It's just applied differently and to produce quicker results. Um, there was a GAO report talking about the challenges of committing staff for Agile projects. And if you're interested in that, happy to share that. Or, or the slides, all the background information, happy to follow up with any of this information. Um, a lot of this is pulled from a lot of these reports. Uh, okay. And so all this points to that the transformation is real and it's happening. Uh, it's active right now. There are agencies that are doing this. Um, and quickly, just some real fast stats here. 18F, in the GSA has grown from 15 people when it started, I think in 2013, to 130 or 120 person team. Uh, the US Digital Services started out as a dozen, has now 50 or 60, plans to grow to much bigger next year. Um, we, we had some examples about what's happening with uh, uh, agencies like the Citizen and Immigration Services, how they're using their own contract vehicles, and how 18F is now using, is now working with 16 agencies on a range of projects. And if you go to 18F's website, they actually have a dashboard that shows all the projects, all the stages of the dash, all the projects, and the code repositories and the ability to fork them and use them. There's been a lot of press about the GSA's work to build this new federal marketplace of Agile vendors. I mean, this is in the news like in the last couple of weeks, and it's been really big. What was super innovative about what GSA did, and we participated in this, and I think it was incredible, which was rather than having, a, uh, in order to build this network of federal contractors, rather than doing a, a very detail-oriented, big uh, procurement uh, RFP, uh, they basically had some general guidelines and you had to use agile practices and, and submit working code in 10 days using these practices. So um, it was awesome. They basically said, here's the open FDA data set. You come up with an innovative app that uses this data, <laughs> use the digital services playbook and the tech var, and submit it and we'll evaluate it, and that's how we're gonna build this federal marketplace of agile vendors that we're gonna then place into agencies. Um, they're expected to choose about 20 agile-focused companies later this month or next month. Um, there's an increasingly spirit, increasingly, uh, there's a spirit of transparency with these dashboards highlighting all the agile work. Um, there's more than 200 public repositories on GitHub right now. Um, just a momentum of successful engagements and good will uh, being generated by the people that are that are being innovative. You know these champions. Uh, you know, I, you know what's happening. You can look at a bunch of different agencies, and there's particular champions that are really driving success at each of them. And I think a lot of people are watching them to see how this will unfold. Um, and then there's a, the way of the media attention that continues to see, like, you know, what's going to happen. This is a lot more fun for a lot of reporters to cover than cybersecurity breaches, you know, talking about, you know, not what's going wrong, but what's going right in the future and what's possible. And I think that's, that's exciting. All right. I'm going to open it up, but we are 
I, I'm welcome. To, I'm happy to stay. I know we're entering lunchtime. Um, but thank you so much. This is really great. I appreciate you all coming. <laughs>